This is the story of a predator, five foot long, with lethal teeth and a flair for surprise attack. The great barracuda has had a very bad press. Scare movies would have us believe that they crave human flesh. It isn't so. But that doesn't mean that it's always safe to go into the water. In 1997, in Florida's boating capital, Miami, a local woman experienced a close encounter with a great barracuda. And what began as a routine dive turned into a bloody nightmare. Due to an accident in the clearing stages, and remember Biscayne Boulevard. underwater boat maintenance service, Mary Ann Boyer Willis says she's never even been close to the kind of attack she went through when a five foot long barracuda took a chunk out of her left arm. I took off my uh, air hose and everything, laid it on my one of the customer's boats and so I just free dove. Um, <clears throat> next thing I know, it felt like a log ran into me, but it was barracuda. I didn't see his face until so he went through my arm and uh, I saw him. And so that, I knew it was that and then I saw my arm and so I swam back to the dive platform and um, I saw some cushy thing coming out of my arm. I guess it was an artery or something. Surgeons at Jackson Memorial Hospital spent three hours repairing both the vein and nerve that were damaged, but it will be a while before doctors know how full a recovery Willis actually will have. Mary Ann was not alone. In the world's busiest waters off Florida, many a diver has a sorry tale to tell. are strangely attractive to Great Barracuda. Come in, Captain Spencer Slate. One of the times I had an encounter with Barracuda, he hit me in the mask with such force that it crushed my sinus and actually permitted, prevented me from diving for about three months until my little sinus rehealed. And that was a pretty painful hit. It was better than uh, I, would, I would relate it to getting hit by a prize fighter. I thought I was going to get knocked out, but it did hurt. And it was a serious hit. A man who has never been bitten and knows more than most about these creatures is marine biologist Dr. Shane Patterson. He has great respect for the great barracuda, not only the largest and most feared, but also the most widely studied of the 20 species. Although the great barracuda is most common in the waters off Florida, Dr. Patterson conducts some of his research from the safety of dry land at the Tennessee Aquarium. Barracuda can be a very dangerous animal. They are equipped with a nasty set of teeth that can inflict quite a wound on a human being or any of the natural prey. Barracuda's teeth are extremely sharp and they have powerful jaw muscles. Even a raking injury, a glancing blow from this fish can cause a massive wound, a lot of bleeding, a lot of tissue damage. The reason why they have these large canines up front that will actually impale prey, but these cutting teeth are also extremely sharp along the sides. The effect of a barracuda bite is basically that of a meat cleaver moving rapidly through the water and slashing through the tendons and muscle and even the bone of whatever it hits. Contrary to popular belief, barracuda do not prey on divers and snorkelers, although they are exceptionally inquisitive. Their quarry are other fish, occasionally their own kin, 
that swim into their favorite haunt, the coral reefs of tropical seas and oceans. Barracuda have a layer of slime covering their bodies. This cuts down on friction with the water, making it easier for them to reach their top speed. They are ambush predators, built like torpedoes, and blessed with the ability to accelerate up to 30 miles an hour from a standstill. They have established themselves as the top guns of the coral reef, and in the race for survival, Snapper, Grunts, and Chub stand little chance of escaping the jaws of these speed merchants. Barracuda are predators, not scavengers. They enjoy the chase and appear to be disinterested in prey which are no longer moving. But why is it that Barracuda, who live on fish, do sometimes attack humans? Dr. Shane Patterson sheds more light on the subject. That's something that you definitely don't want to do underwater if you could possibly help it. Barracuda home in on flashing objects. To them, flashing objects mean food because they look like the scales of the fishes that they eat. So if you jump in the water with a shiny dive watch or a piece of jewelry, piece of dive gear, a tool, Barracuda may well mistake it for its natural prey. There are certain environmental conditions that make this more likely. The, the two main ones would be reduced visibility, murky water, or uh, low light levels, twilight. Nighttime. Same conditions most shock attacks occur. The Barracuda's eyes are attuned to the long wavelengths of light which prevail throughout dusk and dawn. This is their prime hunting time. In these ideal conditions, great Barracuda often hunt as a pack. Baitfish try to protect themselves by forming into a tight school. All to no avail. When the Barracuda is about, there's only limited safety in numbers. In a crowded ocean, the Barracuda's jet-like speed can have some disastrous results. The trouble is the Barracuda moves so quickly when they're on a predatory strike that they can't possibly call off the action before it's too late and there's no way the human can react. We just can't react that quickly. So the end result is that you have a Barracuda attack. Three years after her ordeal on the Florida coast, Marianne Boyer still works in the water, maintaining boats. She is left with not only the scars, but a grim reminder of what is believed to be her assailant. Here's the uh, Barracuda that bit me. And this is where it happened, right here. It was a very clear day um, in the middle of the afternoon. It was very, I do remember, it was very sunny and very glary as far as the sun and then the water go. And I swam about 10 feet from the boat that I jumped into the water from. And all of a sudden, I felt like, bam. And I immediately looked to my right, and I saw a five-foot barracuda. So I knew that I probably had been bit. And then I saw a lot of blood in the water and around my face and everything. So I swam pretty fast and, and got out of the water as best that I could and got to a dock phone and called the front desk. My brachial artery was just shooting out blood like a, like a geyser. <laughs> my arm, the forearm had been filleted, basically. I lost a third of my blood. It was basically running off both sides of the dock. <laughs> it was pretty bad. He uh, bit me in two areas. He got my, my lower bicep where he, he severed my median nerve, which controls feeling and part of your hand. And he also severed my brachial artery. The whole arm took 100 stitches to repair. I still, to this day, three years later, I still don't have feeling on the inside of my hand, three of the fingers and part of half the hand on the inside. Now, something that I used to ignore, I now respect and I am aware of. If that's, you know, that's basically what had changed me as far as going into the water. Mm. Mm. Wow! Today 
is the first day of the rest of my life. The chocolate chunks everybody wants. Chunky Chips Ahoy, they go fast. It's high season on the Florida Keys, and despite the tales of horror, tourists still flock here to invade the underwater world of the Barracuda. This is the most dived region on Earth. Their guide and protector is Captain Slate. What we call today is actually the creature feature, and I guess if you want to describe it, it's a fish interaction dive. When you go diving, that you interact with the creatures in the sea and have an experience with them. The only person that actually handles the bait is me, the feeder, because we don't want any chance of them being mistaken or someone pulling the fish out of the bag that doesn't know how to do it properly and getting accidentally bitten. Anyone that does this willingly, of course, and feeds barracudas has to run the risk and probably will sooner or later get bitten in some form or the other. I, I feel like the benefits way outweigh the danger in my book. Someone that, that does it for the first time and gets bitten the first time may not think that. This reef is classic barracuda turf. Typically, they're out patrolling their territory, so it might be some time before they put in an appearance. But there's a warm-up before the main event. Resident green moray eels and hungry nurse sharks gather to eat at the captain's table. And who can blame them? Why go hunting when there's a free fish supper close to hand? Over the past 20 years, Captain Slate has developed a remarkable relationship with all these creatures. There's a mutual trust as man and fish reinforce their bond. The supporting act is over. Enter the stars of the show. Barracudas have come through when I feed them and I take my hand and rub them as they go through. And the fact that they can come up to divers in a marine sanctuary where they're not molested and repeatedly take fish from us and be 30 divers in the water and their hands fretting all about and the barracuda weaving all between the divers to come to me to catch the fish. So it's, uh, it's pretty unique. There's risk involved because of course barracuda have razor sharp teeth and they're razor lightning fast. The disadvantage of them is they're faster than we are. You have to be very careful. The ballyhoo that I feed them is a little, sometimes six to 12 inch fish. And once you show them that fish, they come for it. I mean, there's no, no in between. There's a method to it and it's timing is within seconds or half a second. Sometimes I've missed and, and sometimes I've had more than one kuda come up at me and one would bite me. So it, it's very, uh, it's a dangerous trick. You just have to be very careful. We do it very successfully, but once in a while I get bitten. But the kudas are just very fast. You have to remember that. And you have to know not to show the ballyhoo until you want them to come. They're really the most efficient predator in the ocean. I've been diving for 37 years and I've never seen anything to compare to a barracuda as far as a hunter. And of course, the ability to kill is phenomenal. I've seen them bite each other in half in a blink of an eye. For Captain Slate, safety is paramount. His divers never get bitten because it's Slate who takes the risks. 
Oh, he got me the minute I got in the water. I was over trying to get in that grouper swam up and grabbed the fish out of my hand and blocked my view and he popped me. Not a big one, but sucker bitten since I got in the water. All right, Brian, come bandage me up, buddy. <laughs> what a day. I cannot believe it. I've been bit worse about a month ago, actually. They're more dangerous than great white sharks. <laughs> Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, Sundays at 7 on Animal Planet. Great Barracuda are highly successful predators, identified in fossil remains that date back to the time when the great dinosaurs walked the earth. But their success is not all down to being a top predator. Some of these little fish are Barracuda buddies. This coral head is a permanent location for a Barracuda health spa and beauty salon. There's another, more gentle side to the menacing face of the great Barracuda. It sends out safety signals. The position of the Barracuda's body and the darkening of its skin lets the neon gobies know that it's safe for them to get down to work. The cleaning service they provide is vital for the good health of the Barracuda community that lives on this reef. Their skins can become infested with parasites, which the cleaners remove, along with dead scales and mucus. It's a you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours relationship, because Dr. Patterson has observed that the cleaner fish also eat this debris, so they actually feed when they clean. It's a fishy version of teeth flossing. Loyal customers, Barracuda return frequently to the same cleaning station where they know they'll get good service. Dr. Patterson witnesses other large predators, like this grouper, equally dependent on little gobies who grew. Salons are always busy, with Barracuda lining up to wait their turn. For Shane Patterson, it's a welcome opportunity to study a fish whose incredible speed and guile normally make it difficult to observe. It's clear that when they're in a passive mood, they seem to live in peaceful coexistence with other marine species. Well, I don't know what that, uh, I don't know what the turtle was about, but there's another, um, association that we see a lot more often, that's the cleaning symbiosis. Uh, there are a bunch of barracuda queued up in a, a big line down there. If you follow a barracuda around for a couple of hours or so, you'll often notice that it returns to the same cleaning station again and again. They seem kind of addicted to this uh, kind of attention. What we're going to do now is uh, go down on a, a uh, wreck called the Duane. It's a Coast Guard cutter. Like uh, most such structures, it attracts a lot of barracuda. There's one in particular that uh, you see a lot in the uh, in the bridge in the wheelhouse of the wreck. I've heard it called Psycho, which is actually a pretty common name applied to Barracuda. So we're gonna go and pay Psycho a visit and check out his friends down in the Duane.
Psycho stalks the wreck of the Duane, ever watchful for the next party of divers. This is his turf. Enter at your peril. Shipwrecks litter the seabed along the Florida coast. Barracuda adapt especially well to this man-made environment. They're well aware of the divers who come to explore the wrecks and frequently play games of hide and seek. The Barracuda have taken over command of this ship, and an eerie atmosphere pervades. There's a sense of being watched. Some great Barracuda can live more than 15 years, and once they've established a home, they rarely move. But it's not only divers and scientists who know where they can be found. Florida is famous for its fishing, and barracuda are a fish that fascinates, so they've become a big attraction, almost an icon. The downside for the barracuda is it's becoming a sporting trophy. The hunter of the sea is now the hunted. For $100 a day, anyone can join in the chase. Come on, baby. Come to Papa. There you come. Nice fish. All right. We won't gaff him, we'll just release him. All right. High five. Good man. Beautiful. See the small hook that's in him? Beautiful fish. See, we got the hook Very right in the corner hook. of his mouth. Oh, yeah. Nice fish, Bruce. Let him fight again another day. Most fishermen release their catch, and not simply out of kindness. Barracuda eat smaller, toxic fish, so their flesh can become poisonous and can even kill a human being. Ciguatera poisoning, as it is known, is as infamous as the barracuda Beautiful. itself. And in Florida, barracuda are rarely caught as food. You know, your average fish are anywhere from a couple of pounds to 20 is beautiful. Like the ones we were catching earlier were you know, 10 to 12 pounds. Anywhere between 35 and 47 pounds, you know, is, is an exceptional fish. And I'm sure down deeper there, there's some of the some of the bigger ones. Well, I haven't got lucky enough to even hook one. There he is. You got one? Yeah. Ooh, I think he spit it. Dropped it out. I had him for a second there. Chips Ahoy! They go fast! All too often, the Barracuda's sharp teeth and rapid speed will snap the fishing line before they're landed. They may be the ones that got away, but a double hook and a length of fishing line still skewer their jaw. Here at the Aquarius Undersea Habitat, a reef observation center 70 feet deep off the coast of Florida, the Barracuda can find sanctuary.
One man doing his best to help the injured is Jay Styron, who operates an unofficial casualty department. Jay spends much of his time living in the habitat, earning the trust of Barracuda, who still carry relics of their battles with fishermen. You know, see, we just had a Barracuda swim by, and every once in a while we would notice them have leaders or hooks hanging out of their mouths from the people fishing around the area. So I just started seeing if I could catch them. It was a lot more difficult than I thought, so then I went to free diving and found that you could get a lot closer to them if you weren't exhaling bubbles all around them and scaring them all the time, and you're a lot more streamlined and can maneuver a lot better. May not catch the one that day, but maybe the day or two later, they'll uh, calm down enough and you can actually catch most of them. Generally, I'm snorkeling around, free diving, and spot a barracuda with a leader that's long enough to really approach, because barracuda themselves will approach you within inches, but you approaching them is a different story. Then I'll try to get behind them, and I'll dive down below them, and then look up and start sticking my hand out just in front of me so I'm not making any sudden grabs towards them right at the last second, so it's already there. generally just keep pace with them and a lot of times they'll start swimming forward slightly as you're getting closer so you're just angling up trailing behind them and if everything works out well you'll have the leader in your hand then you've got to really clamp down and try to get a wrap around your hand so they don't yank the leader right through your hand circling around trying to shake the hook, I'm gradually coming to the surface with them and after they've tired out sufficiently that I can grab them by the tail, I'll turn them upside down and they go into a tonic state and then it, I either decide to get the hook out then if it's just in the jaw and it's easily removable or I'll bring it to the boat and get somebody on the boat to help me with a pair of pliers. Tonic immobility is well known in many animals when they're startled or restrained, especially upside down. It's a freeze reaction that is not fully understood, but is known to work well on barracuda. It also makes the work of the scientist much safer. Well, another barracuda is swimming free. As you see, this is usually what you find hanging out the barracuda's mouth down there. Looks like it may have been in maybe a week, 10 days. Uh, it probably would have eventually rusted out, but it's nice to get it out of there so they can feed unhampered. of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, Sundays at 7 on Animal Planet. Surprisingly, in some parts of the world, it's the barracuda which actually help the fishermen. There are fishing stories involving barracuda that have a slightly happier ending for both barracuda and fishermen than some of the ones that we've heard and seen. This very interesting archival footage from the Pacific Ocean was shot some number of years ago. The uh, fisherman works with the barracuda out at the fishing site to herd large schools of prey fishes using the barracuda as a uh, cooperating agent in the water. The fisherman throws a bit of pumpkin overboard, kind of acts as a nucleus for the, the prey fishes, the little silver fishes that have gathered there so far. 
and it sets it up perfectly for the barracuda to circle around and herd the little fishes into a tighter ball. And the fishermen drop their nets over this ball and just hold it up. The key to the success of this relationship is the barracuda's ability to herd the, the fishes in the first place, which is a very common behavior in their foraging, whether feeding alone or feeding in a group. Or of course, the barracuda's ability to learn, and it's learning to associate the payoff with a, a pretty easy day's work, just rounding up a few fishes. So it's mutually beneficial association. Many people would not associate fishes in general, and barracuda in particular, with any great degree of intelligence, but the barracuda can learn. And in this case, I think it's fair to say that you can teach an old barracuda new tricks. Although it's the great barracuda that gets most attention, Dr. Patterson has also studied behavior in other barracuda species. One of the really interesting and slightly ironic twists about this whole episode is that barracuda, including great barracuda, as well as some of the other 19 or so species, also form schools that can be very large in size. And these schools may also have an anti-predatory function. In this respect, it's true that even predators are potential prey to somebody else. These blackfin barracuda are typical of smaller species, which form into massive schools in many regions of the Pacific Ocean. A school like this contains around one and a half thousand fish. these huge circling schools create is a great draw for divers. These mass formations offer some degree of safety in numbers for smaller species of barracuda. Back along the coast of Florida, it's the great barracuda who may also need to find protection. Adult fish have few natural enemies, but when they're young, they're extremely vulnerable. From the moment they're born, they're on their own, left to survive without the protection of an adult. They find safety in the mangroves. Hey, here we are in a slightly different kind of habitat. This is the uh, mangroves, a very extensive tract, actually. Among the roots live a lot of small reef fishes that are babies, including baby barracuda, and you'll also find things like juvenile lemon sharks. And uh, this is basically a nursery, and the fishes grow up and they move out to the reef eventually. So we're going to get in, and uh, hopefully we'll find some small barracuda. They may be this big. There's quite a few that size here, maybe up to that size. And we'll see what they're doing, what they're up to. Once a year, adults spawn in open waters, but no one knows exactly where. We do know that the babies end up in the mangroves after drifting in on ocean currents. Here, thousands of minuscule marine minnows provide plenty of food for the growing barracuda. stay deep in the tangle of roots, looking out for prey and hiding from other young predators. The mangrove offers a training ground for survival. Young lemon sharks grow up here too. Their stealth takes time to develop. Safe in their tidal labyrinth, 
the baby barracuda will soon outgrow the mangrove. Coastal sea grasses then become their favorite haunt. Here, they rely on the barracuda's infamous ability to disappear through camouflage. It helps them to ambush prey, and it keeps them concealed from their own predators. They master this technique at an early age. They mature at two years old. Once they grow big enough to leave the sea grass, they venture into open water and head towards the coral reef. Unlike the mangrove, there's little protection, but there are still plenty of bigger predators. Caribbean reef sharks compete for dominance of the reef. Barracuda has as much reason to fear as it is feared, but the myth that they're vicious killers that attack swimmers still lives on, fueled no doubt by horror movies. This one starred an unfortunate but somewhat familiar diver called Captain Bob Olson. This unusual incident, the fish became confused and bit Olsen in the face with its razor-sharp teeth. Writhing in pain and in a state of shock, the crew members and tourists worked frantically to save the wounded man. Although this injury had resulted from an accident, it was serious enough to nearly cost Olsen his life. Pretty horrific stuff. And strictly for the movies. Here's the man who knows. There are many times when I go out on a Friday feeding that people have heard of me feeding for years and decades, and they get on the boat and they say, Slate, aren't you scared to do that? We saw this movie where this man got attacked and his face got mauled up by a barracuda and he almost died. Aren't you terrified of that? And I kind of giggle and I give him, I said, well, was a guy's name uh, Captain Bob Olson off the Yucatan Peninsula? And he goes, yeah. I said, that was me. It was absolutely totally made up for the show and to make a big event of a barracuda biting someone, which, of course, we had to fake it, and I was glad of that. The captain's blood was fake. Marianne's was all too real. Today, the real-life victim has a date with the movie stuntman. He's invited her on a dive to meet his playmates and her enemy. Hi. Sunday night. Get closer than ever before for a wild look at the very best of Animal Planet. Open wide. From haunted wars to homebody hippos. Who would have thought they were so talented? Don't miss Terry and Bendy as they roll out the red carpet for our greatest shows and specials. Planet's Best, hosted by Terry and Bendy, Sunday night at 8, only on Animal Planet. <laughs> Two people with a very different approach to Barracuda set out on an experimental journey. When I see my first time divers and snorkelers get in the water and have a fear of this animal, and by the time the feeding's over, have no fear of this animal or, or more respect than fear, to the point that they're not going to fear him and get in the water and go diving, and then I feel like it's worth the risk. And having Marianne on the boat today and feeding with me. Knowing that she went through a, a barracuda attack, uh, any kind of injury that requires 100 stitches is serious. But to have her on a boat today is just a joy, and I'm tickled to death to formally meet her and get to go diving with her today. I'm excited. I think she'll come away with a better respect for him, and I believe she'll enjoy him even more. Mm -hmm. 
I don't want to be right next to Mr. Slade. I want to watch him from a little bit of a distance. <laughs> but um, no, I'm excited. I want to see. I want to see it happen. I think it'll be a neat thing. For the fearless Captain Slate, this is just another dive to visit old friends. Just another day at the office. For Mary Ann, it's a different kettle of fish. One they both hope will turn out to be beneficial. Any diver unfamiliar with the behavior of Barracuda would find this a nerve-wracking experience. Until now, Mary Ann has only been really close to one great Barracuda, and she doesn't want a repeat of that incident. Even though she knows Captain Slate will be looking out for her, Mary Ann knows the damage a barracuda can inflict. Are the fish beginning to show an uncanny interest in Mary Ann? Slate draws their attention back to himself, and in so doing, shows Marianne his full repertoire of feeding techniques. Marianne can only watch in disbelief. show a remarkable patience and precision. They miss the captain's face by inches. After the show, Captain Slate congratulates Mary Ann for meeting his Barracuda face to face. Mary Ann knew the great Barracuda's reputation as a fearsome hunter before she made this dive. After witnessing the captain's fearless feeding display, she's now seen that the fish is not the willful and dangerous animal that many believe it to be, and its reputation as a manhunter has been greatly exaggerated. But getting so close to the big fish again has been exhausting. For Captain Slate, it's been an opportunity to meet one of the few divers unlucky enough to be bitten by a great barracuda. The Great Barracuda's hunting grounds are the most dived waters in the world. Surely the fact that they do not run with the blood of hundreds of hapless divers is testament to the placid nature of these intelligent.